Okay, so welcome everyone to the USMLE step one lecture for the reproductive system for batch number three, lecture number six by Dr. Hyderi. <clears throat> Thank you so much for joining the lecture. Hope you guys are doing well. If you guys can hear my voice, can I give, please get a yes in the chat box? <clears throat> if you guys can hear my voice, can I please get a yes in the chat box, please? Okay, good. Thank you so much for joining the lecture and I wish you guys have had a very good week and I hope you have a very good weekend. Uh, today is the last class of the week. Uh, today we are going to finish the reproductive system. So let's not wait any more time. Is everyone ready? Yes or no? Fast chances, please. Is everyone ready? Yeah. Now, while we wait for some of the students to sort of come and join, can I please ask a couple of quick questions from our topics from yesterday so that we can begin the class? Yes or no? Is everyone ready for a couple of quick questions to revise and recapitulate the topics from yesterday before we begin? Yes or no? Okay. okay. Can I get the attention of Dr. Otero over here very quickly? Would you be kind enough to unmute yourself? Yes. Were you present in the in the lecture of yesterday? Yes or no? Uh, did you receive the lecture recording? Did you receive the, the lecture recording of yesterday? You did? Okay. Did you watch the recording, yes or no? You did, okay, good. So good, let me know if, you, if there's anything that you don't understand or if there's anything that you want me to repeat. So that's that. Now, a quick revision and recapitulation I just want to conduct regarding the testicular tumors. Okay. One more time, is everyone ready? Yes or no? For the testicular tumors? Testicular tumors, is everyone ready? Yes or no? Okay. So you have a patient who comes to you with a testicular mass, so it's a young adult patient, and we do a biopsy by doing a total orchidectomy. And in the biopsy, we see fried egg cells. What is your diagnosis? Seminoma. Can I get some response from the rest of the students, please? Very good. Okay. If the biopsy contained uh, tissues from all the other germ layers, what would be the diagnosis? Teratoma. If the, if the biopsy contained, if the biopsy contained Schiller Duval bodies, what would be the diagnosis? Very good. If the biopsy contained, um, if biopsy contained hydropic villi, cyto and syncytial trophoblast and HCG is very high, what would be the diagnosis? <clears throat> what, would, what would be the diagnosis? Real carcinoma, very good, okay. Real carcinoma, okay, good. Now, let's bring our attention to page number 678 of the first state with epididymitis and orchitis. Is everyone ready? Yes or no to begin. Now, when I talk about epididymitis and orchitis, what I do want to talk about is um, I want to talk about the friend sign. Can anyone explain to me what the friend sign is? Please write me in the chat box. Friend sign.
what is the friend sign? Friend sign. E H R E N, friend sign. Can I get the attention of Dr. Singh? What is friend sign, Dr. Singh? Uh, on lifting the testis, if the on lifting the testis, if the pain uh, decreases, then it is positive. Very good. Thank you so much. On lifting a unilateral testis, if there is pain and if the pain decreases, then that, that, that is friend sign positive. Okay, then that is friend sign positive. Let's begin with that. Thank you so much, Dr. Singh, for helping us out. Okay. Now, let's begin with the lecture from over here, epididymitis and orchitis. First, before I begin, I just want to let you know that epididymitis and orchitis, please remember this for your step one and step two CK. Please remember this for your step one and step two CK. epididymitis and prostatitis, very, very important. Once again, for the fact that the prevalence of these two diseases in the, in the United States is very, very high, meaning that the amount of patients you will get is very, very high regarding this. So you need to understand what sort of organisms are responsible for this and how do they present themselves? What are the treatments? So APD, dermitis, and orchitis, the most common causes in young males are chlamydia and Nigeria gonorrhea. Nigeria gonorrhea is a gram-negative intracellular diplococci, right? And chlamydia is also a gram-negative organism. So these are the two organisms that's very high yield. For, you, for the treatment of chlamydia tr trachomatis and Nigeria boundary, what do we give? We give a combination of ceftriaxone and doxycycline. If you guys want, you can write this down. Ceftriaxone and doxycycline. We give a combination for the treatment of this. We give ceftriaxone for, for Nigeria, for chlamydia, we try to prescribe doxycycline. Next is E. coli and pseudomonas. This is very important because this is common in older males, very important they give you questions and they expect you to answer regarding the age of the patients. So if it's a young male, then Nigeria and chlamydia, if it's older, then E. coli and pseudomonas, they are very high yield. And sometimes there could also be autoimmune infections. This is not important, okay? Now, what is epididymitis? This is inflammation of the epididymitis. This presents with local pain and tenderness over posterior testis. Always remember this, the pain is in the back of the testis. The pain is in the back of the testis. And friend sign over here is positive meaning that after you try to lift the testis, what happens is, well, what happens is well, there is pain relief with scrotal elevation. Now, let me tell you why. Um, when the testis, when the APD demise, when the uh, APD dimis is swollen and it's inflamed, isn't there a possibility that the surrounding nerves are getting irritated with all the swelling? Yes or no? Fast answers, please. The answer is yes or no. If the posterior testis is swollen, the APD dime the epididymis is also swollen, then the surrounding nerves, the, they, get, they get irritated. And when they get irritated, you, you, you experience more pain. So what happens is when you lift off the testis, the swelling is not, uh, the swelling is not contributing as much to the pain as possible. Meaning that when you lift the testis, the surrounding nerves are not as irritated. So the pain which the patient was experiencing gets relieved with scrotal elevation. So that's it. And they may progress to involve the, the testicles, meaning that if you do not treat APD dem dermitis, this can lead to the patient developing orchitis. What is orchitis? This is inflammation of the testis. How does it present the, itself? It, it, it presents with pain, swelling, tenderness, congestion, or uh, your some sort of, um, for example, over here, the patient can, in majority of the condition, the pain is localized, but if it's an infection and if there is systemic uh, involvement of the infection, patients can also experience fever. One of the highest yield organisms that uh, can cause or, uh, orchitis is mumps, the mumps virus, right? Mumps virus, one of the complications of mumps is that it causes severe orchitis. And what happens is if you do not treat orchitis, can we experience infertility, yes or no? The answer is yes. To increase risk of infertility. Orchitis is rare in males less than 10 years of age. That's that, okay? Now, let's talk about benign prostatic hyperplasia. Before I talk about benign prostatic hyperplasia, I just wanna, <clears throat> just, just wanna bring something to your attention over here. What is the prostate, right? So the prostate is basically the organism that have a couple of 
lobes, right? And in which lobe do we have what sort of disease is actually a very, very important. So let me just draw the prostate over here very quickly before I jump into the lecture. So we have one lobe like this of the prostate, and then we have another lobe like this of the prostate, right? This is a very rough diagram. I apologize for the bad diagram because my stylus pen, yesterday while I was taking the class, I dropped my stylus pen in coffee and that completely destroyed my stylus pen. So most of my drawings today will be really, really bad. I apologize uh, beforehand. Oh, so now, um, this is the prostate. In the prostate, you have two lobes, right? You have these two lobes, the blue lobes, that will stay on the lateral side. So that's why we call them the lateral lobes. We have another lobe that stays in the bottom or the posterior portion, which I'm gonna use my red pen for. This is the posterior. This is the posterior lobe. And there's one lobe that stays right in the middle for which I'm gonna use my green pen. This is the middle lobe, as simple as that, okay? So we have the two lateral lobes, one middle lobe, one posterior lobe. And now if there's a posterior lobe, shouldn't there also be an anterior lobe? Yes or no? The answer is yes, okay? So how many lobes does the prostate have? The prostate has five lobes. That is anterior, posterior, middle, and two laterals. And in between the anterior lobe and the middle lobe, right? In between the anterior lobe and the middle lobe, you have the urethra, right? You have the male urethra. Now, where do we experience benign prostatic hyperplasia and where do we experience prostatic carcinoma? Always, uh, you have to remember this. Always remember that we experience benign prostatic hyperplasia, uh, which usually arises from the two lateral lobes, right? Which usually it, it arises from the two lateral lobes and uh, the prostatic cancer, they arise from the posterior lobe. It's easy to remember that the prostatic cancer arises from the posterior lobe because P for posterior, P for prostatic cancer. Okay. And benign prostatic hyperplasia, benign prostatic hyperplasia, you can understand that benign prosthetic, we can get hyperplasia of the two lateral lobes and we can also get hyperplasia a little bit of the middle lobe. So uh, if you, the next time you get asked a question that where do we get benign prosthetic hyperplasia, the answer is it's usually in the two lateral lobes. So in the blue lobes, you'll get hyperplasia and in the green and in the red lobe, you will get the carcinoma. So that's all I wanted to make you guys understand. Now let's jump into the lecture. The benign prosthetic hyperplasia is common in males about 50 years of age. How do we conduct benign prostatic hyper? I mean, how do we know in a clinical setting that a patient has benign prostatic hyperplasia? First and foremost, the patient will come to you. The patient will be a male patient about the age of 50 years coming to, coming to you with lower urinary tract symptoms. Can anyone tell me what are the lower urinary tract symptoms? Is it increased urinary frequency? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Dysuria? Yes or no? The answer is yes. In, in, in yeah, you, uh, urinary incontinence, yes or no? The answer is yes. Urinary urgency, then what else? Then a feeling of incomplete voiding of urine, yes or no? Feeling of incomplete voiding of urine. The answer is yes, right? So they will come to us with these sort of things. Weak stream, very good. So that's that. Now, when the patient comes to us with this sort of issue, what do we do? In a clinical setting, first, first thing that we do is we do a digital rectal examination. Yes or no? Do we do a DRE? DRE is a digital rectal examination. So when we, so what we do is uh, we wear a glove. We take a little bit of we take a little bit of lubricant. Then we approach the when we approach to examine the prostate via the rectal pathway. When we do that, we try to see a couple of things. We try to see if the prostate is swollen. We try to see the uh, upper pole of the prostate. We try to see how swollen the prostate is. We try to see the smoothness of the prostate. We try to see if there's any nodularity or irregularity of the prostate. We try to see if there's bleeding or no bleeding from the prostate. We try to see if there's pain in the prostate, right? So in benign prostatic hyperplasia, do we see that the upper pole of the prostate is, um, the upper pole of the prostate is easily reached, yes or no? The answer is yes, because normally uh, the upper pole of the prostate cannot be reached. Next one is, do we find smooth enlargement, smooth enlargement of the, of, the, of the prostate, yes or no? The answer is yes. Do we see bleeding, yes or no? Do we see bleeding in benign prostatic hyperplasia? The answer is 
Yes or no? Fast answers, please. I, I require some fast answers from you guys today if I want to finish the reproductive system. Do I see bleeding in benign prosthetic hyperplasia or no bleeding? Which one? Fast answers, please. No bleeding. Very good. There's absolutely no bleeding over here. And uh, another thing that we see is, do we, does the patient experience pain when I palpate the prostate? Yes or no? The answer is, the patient experiences pain or not? The answer is no pain, no pain. So it's a painless, mood, elastic, firm enlargement of the prostate. And the enlargement is usually in the lateral lobes and in the middle lobe, which compresses the urethra to form a vertical slit. So this is not pre-malignant, okay? Now, what is the pathology of benign prosthetic hyperplasia? The pathology of benign prosthetic hyperplasia is patients who have high amount of testosterone or dihydroxytestosterone, DHT, that can cause excessive sw swelling of the lateral lobes. Okay, that causes excessive swelling of the lateral lobes. It presents with increased frequency of urination, nocturia, difficulty starting and stopping urine. This may lead to distension and hypertrophy of the bladder and hydronephrosis. Makes sense. For example, patients who have benign prosthetic hyperplasia, do they have the urine sitting in the bladder for a longer period of, period of time? Yes or no? The answer is yes. And the urine is a fertile ground for organisms to grow. So can they experience recurrent UTIs? Yes or no? The answer is yes, right? And the PSA. PSA is prostate-specific antigen. This is also a little bit high. Now, PSA is made by prostatic epithelium that is stimulated by androgens. So that makes sense. Since DHT is responsible, by hydroxytestosterone is responsible for uh, giving rise Right, since dihydroxytestosterone is responsible for giving rise to the prosthetic hyperplasia, that's why under the influence of androgens, there is a lot of release of prostate-specific antigen, and that causes that's it, that and that is increased, and that and we can also see this in benign prosthetic hyperplasia. Okay, very quickly, how do we solve benign prosthetic hyperplasia? We can go for medical intervention, or we can go for surgical intervention. The number one medical intervention that we will go for is alpha-1 antagonists, alpha-1 antagonists. Alpha-1 antagonists, they work specifically in the prosthetic area, right? And alpha-1 antagonists mean that, will they cause the smooth muscle of the prostate to undergo vasoconstriction or dilatation? The answer is they will prevent vasoconstriction, so they will cause dilatation. Since alpha-1 is a smooth muscle vasoconstrictor, antagonists of alpha-1 will cause smooth muscle dilatation which causes relaxation of the smooth muscle. We can also give 5-alpha reductase inhibitors and 5-alpha reductase inhibitors will prevent the conversion of testosterone to dihydroxytestosterone. So that's how you can decrease this. Another one is we can give PDE5 inhibitor, meaning phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors, such as, <clears throat> such as uh, tadalafil, right? Phosphodiesterase inhibitors. Now, phosphodiesterase 5 is a drug that is used to break down an that is used to break down amines or amines, right? And amines or amines are vasodilators. So if you prevent the enzyme that is breaking down the vasodilators, do you have more, uh, do you have more neurotransmitters which are responsible for vasodilatation in the prostatic area? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Try to understand what I'm saying over here. Phosphodiesterase 5 is an enzyme in your body that breaks down vasoactive amines that breaks down vasoactive amines, right? If you give a phosphodiesterase inhibitor, do you have more vasoactive amines or less vasoactive amines? <clears throat> Fast answers, please. The answer is, do you have more or less? Less, how do you have less? Try to understand what I'm saying. Vasoactive amines or vasoactive amines or amines are broken down by phosphodiesterase 5. If you give a phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitor, inhibitor, if you gave a phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitor, is the phosphodiesterase 5 um, being able to work, yes or no? Are you inhibiting the phosphodiesterase 5? The answer is, the answer is yes, you are. You are preventing the action of phosphodiesterase 5. If you are preventing the action of phosphodiesterase 5, then can the phosphodiesterase 5 break down the vasoactive amines? The answer is no. As a result, can there be more vasoactive amines? The answer is yes. If there is more vasoactive amines, can we have more CAMP and more smooth muscle dilatation? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Did you guys understand this? Yes or no? Last chances, please.
Okay. Now my next question is, are you going to give phosphodiesterase 5 to a patient who has benign prostatic hyperplasia and to a patient who is also taking nitroglycerin? Yes or no? The answer is no. Okay, why? Because nitroglycerin is broken down by phosphodiesterase 5. Yes or no? Is nitroglycerin broken down by phosphodiesterase 5? The answer is yes. If you give a phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitor, can we have a lot of nitroglycerin? Yes or no? The answer is yes. In that case, can we have severe vasodilatation and onset of shock due to loss of blood vessel tone? The answer is yes, right? So what are the three groups of drugs that we will give for BPH? Number one, alpha-1 antagonist. Number two, 5-alpha reductase. Number three, PDE5 inhibitors, right? And after medical management, if the patient is still symptomatic, then we will go for two procedures. Number one, PURP. Who can tell me what does TURP stand for? I'm going to give you two seconds to write me in the chat box. TURP, what does this stand for? TURP. Yes, Dr. Sana. It's transurethral resection of prostate. Transurethral resection of prostate. Did you not receive the link today in your email, Dr. Sana? Yeah, I was actually trying to log in with the previous one, but um, it showed that the host has not started the meeting yet. So I was a bit confused that maybe the link is not working properly, but oh. the class was scheduled late. So. Oh, no, that's because the host was sleeping. My apologies. Oh, for I'm that. sorry. Okay. <laughs> no, <that's laughs> I apologize because I was feeling really bad in the morning. So I, I, I took some time to start the class. So I apologize for that. But uh, I just want to make sure if you receive the class, a link on time or not. Just give me one second. So I sent this yesterday. Okay, this is what I sent today. But when I send this over here, let me see if your name is here. Did, did you receive this link? Yes or no? Yes, the next one I did receive. The one that you sent a bit late, maybe by uh, an, uh, after an hour or so, or maybe after the 45 minutes of the schedule time. Okay, okay. Meeting recording of lecture number six. Yes, Dr. Rahimi, do you, what do you want to say? Yeah, I want to say, can you please, uh, like when you set a time, uh, it's be certain because uh, some of us, like we are living in California, we are waking up early in the morning and right. with kids and some class. Makes it's sense. okay if you make it right. late, no, but that's, in that's, a certain that's, time. That's, Right, no, that makes sense. I apologize for that. The reason being it's is because I, I've been a little bit sick throughout the whole whole week, so I I'm trying I'm to really push myself. That. Right, I'm I'm trying to really push myself with the morning batch and the evening batch and everything else. No, so uh, I can't. Don't don't push yourself. Uh, it's right that uh, you came late, right. but uh, so, please make it yes. in a certain time. Definitely, I apologize for this, and I'll completely <laughs> take that in mind. From next week, we'll be certain. Okay. Thank you. Oh, okay. No, that's it. So I just wanted to make sure if everyone is receiving the links and the recordings are on time or not. Okay, good. So that's that. Uh, but I saw it on review. Okay, good. Now let's get back to the text over here. So what's happening? So we have um, the 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, PD-5 inhibitors, and the alpha-1 uh, antagonist. And according to what uh, the physician has just said, that... Um, TURP stands for transurethral reception receipt, of prostate and ablation. So these are the two procedures that we can do to get rid of the ecstatic, the excessive prostatic tissue. Now, now uh, prostatitis, before I begin this, Dr. Otero, do you have any concerns? Yes or no? Do you want to unmute yourself and ask me a question very quickly? Hello, Doctor. Good morning. Yes, Good morning. Uh, I just want to clarify uh, two things. Uh, I've been receiving the link I um, saw it and also, but I didn't review the whole thing to, because I couldn't. So I just want to verify that. And also, uh, Dr. Sana, I think uh, when, you, when the lecture started, uh, you can open the link and until the host is available, it will uh, open automatically. You just... Oh, okay. uh, uh -huh. oh, 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 okay. All right. Oh, okay. Makes sense. Yeah. But I, I just want to make sure very quickly uh, over here that I, I'm, I'm giving you the lecture recordings. Are you having any, any difficulty opening the lecture recordings? Yes or no? The thing is, I think I've been receiving, but I, but I had, I don't know. Um, sorry. Um, like, 
late or I mean yesterday was uh, early morning I think okay but I haven't I, I just uh, saw it I haven't reviewed it all but uh, I just want to confirm with you that I receive it okay okay good thank you so much if you don't if you if you don't receive it just let me know I'm gonna send you uh, yeah no no you, until right now everything is being uh, you know delivery received good very good okay thank you well, that's good to know now let's begin with prostatitis is everyone ready yes or no what is prostatitis? Prostatitis is acute inflammation of the prostate, as simple as that. Now, if we have acute inflammation of the prostate, before I talk about this, what is the prostate responsible for? Can anyone tell me? The prostate is responsible for supplying the semen with the proper, proper nutrients so that it can survive in the female reproductive system. For the purpose of what? For the purpose of fertilization, right? So prostatitis this is characterized by dysuria, frequency, urgency, low back pain. So these are the same sign symptoms that we usually get for BPH, except over here for prostatitis, the patient has severe pain because the prostate is warm, tender, and enlarged. So in this patient, if we do a DRE, will the patient experience pain or not? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Okay. So well, that's that. Now, there are two types of prostatitis. There could be acute prostatitis or chronic prostatitis. And once again, the organisms for acute and chronic are very, very important. Now, old males, always remember this, if the age of the males are higher than 50, these males are more at risk of getting infected with E. coli, okay? Why? Due to the fact that older males, they have a little bit of difficulty reaching all the way to clean their fecal root when um, they are, like after they are done defecating, right? After they are done defecating, they have a difficult time cleaning their fecal root and that allows for more organisms to reach the urethra from the fecal area. Okay? So that's why, correct? So that's why majority of the males who have acute prostatitis, majority of the males who have had acute prostatitis, they're older males, and maybe they can have some sort of a spinal degenerative disease or a neurodegenerative disease, and that's that. And younger males, they, they are more affected with prostatitis by the same organisms that, if, that affects their APD damage, that is chlamydia and Nigeria, and that's that. So chronic prostatitis is either bacterial or non-bacterial, and that's basically what it is. Organism is E. coli, okay? For E. coli, we try to prescribe the patients and antibiotics, the ceftriaxone. For noise for Nigeria and for chlamydia, we also give ceftriaxone and doxycycline. That's it. So, next one is prostatic adenocarcinoma, very common in males, about 50 years, and a very prevalent cancer in the United States. They arise from the posterior lobe. And this is very important. This will be asked in your step one exam that BPH arises from the lateral lobe and from the middle lobe. Prostatic carcinoma arises from the posterior lobe. This is a very important question, especially the peripheral zone of the posterior lobe, meaning that the zone, the dotted line of the posterior zone is from where you will get the carcinoma. So this is most probably uh, diagnosed. So this is most probably diagnosed by increase of PSA and subsequent needle core biopsy. The patients, they will come to you with the same sort of problems, uh, frequency, urgency, dysuria, incontinence, and everything else. And when we do a DRE this time, what we will see is that we will see we will see irregular enlargement of the prostate, irregular enlargement of the prostate with or without being associated with pain. And now the patient will always, um, and right after you perform the DRE, you will find that there is blood on your gloves, right? So these sort of things, whenever we do a DRE and we find that the prostate is bleeding, the prostate is tender, Right, the prostate is irregular. Should we go for a biopsy or not? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Right. So, so we will go for a needle core biopsy, either via transrectal approach or ultrasonogram guided approach. And what we see is that uh, it, which is based on glandular architecture and correlates closely with the metastatic potential, meaning that we do a biopsy, we take a little bit of the tissue and we try to grade it. Right. We try to grade it. How do we grade? A carcinoma, we grade a carcinoma by seeing a couple of things. First and foremost, we see the degree of anaplasia, meaning how anaplastic is the tissue? That is how much deviation does the tissue have from the normal tissue, right? For example, uh, in a region where there should have been squamous epithelium, if the, tissue is, if the tissue contains glandular epithelium, is that heavily dysplastic, yes or no? The answer is yes, right? So, for example, uh, in a place where there should have been squamous epithelium, if for any reason, 
the tissue has turned itself into a glandular epithelium, then that's heavily dysplastic. So we try to see first and foremost, the degree of dysplasia, number one. Then number two, we try to see the number of chromatins, right? If there is a lot of chromatins in the cells or not, because if there's a lot of chromatins in the cell, this shows that there's abnormal and irregular DNA proliferation, right? Then number three, we try to see the nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio. That is, we try to see the nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio. Usually the cytoplasm is bigger than the nucleus, right? The cytoplasm is bigger than the nucleus in any normal cell. But if it's a carcinogenic cell, then the nucleus, is it conducting a high level of cellular proliferation and growth? Yes or no? The answer is yes, right? So can that cause growth of the nucleus? The answer is yes. So in a carcinoma, the nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio is usually more than one is to one or one is to one, right? That the nucleus is just as big as the cytoplasm. Then what else? We try to see the degree of mitosis, meaning how much mitosis or how much cellular replication is happening in a given time. If there's a lot of replication happening in a given time, is that a good sign or a bad sign? The answer is that's a bad sign, right? Because cells, they're not supposed to replicate in this rate. When they replicate in this rate, the, the, these are the signs of a high-graded tumor. Have I made myself clear, yes or no? How, how to know which one's a high-grade tumor, which one's a low-grade tumor? Yes, okay, good. So we try to do that. And then after that, we try to also see the prostatic acid phosphatase, PSA. And we try to see if PSA is high. If in a patient of prostatic carcinoma, the tumor is a high-grade tumor and PSA is very high, the prognosis is very bad. So, and another thing is prostatic carcinoma will always cause osteoblastic lesion in the spine, osteoblastic lesions in the spine, meaning that they will cause bony deposits, they will cause metastatic deposits. Now, if prostatic carcinoma is responsible for osteoblastic lesions, what sort of carcinoma is responsible for osteosclerotic lesions? Osteosclerotic, meaning bone resorbing lesions. The answer is multiple myeloma. Yes or no? Yeah, very good. The answer is multiple myeloma. So one more time, in the spine, in the spine, if you see deposition of metastasis, this is osteoblastic, this is by prostatic carcinoma. If you see metastasis by where the bone is eaten up, this is osteosclerotic. This is what we see in multiple myeloma. Have I made myself clear? Yes or no? Okay. This is something that you will be asking in step one exam. And when you have osteoblastic lesions or osteosclerotic lesions, along with PSA, you will also get high amount of alkaline phosphatase. That's a, that's a given. So, so serum alkaline phosphatase will also be high. And metastasis to the spine occurs via the vertebral venous plexus. That's also very high. That, that by the vertebral venous plexus, you have the metastasis. Have I made myself clear? Yes or no? Yes? No. So I'm going to give you exactly two minutes to read this page, and then I'm going to move on to reproductive pharmacology. Okay, so two minutes on the clock. Please read this page. Can you repeat the last part? The last part is... In the spine, you can get two types of metastasis, osteoblastic or osteosclerotic. Osteoblastic is by prosthetic carcinoma, osteosclerotic is by multiple myeloma, okay? And the metastasis that happens to the spine from the prostate occurs by the vertebral venous plexus, by the, ve by the veins, not lymph nodes, but by the veins. Okay, have I made myself clear, yes or no? Have I made myself clear? Okay, so I'm going to give you two minutes. I'm going to give you exactly two minutes to read this page. Then I'm going to move on to reproductive pharmacology. Okay, so two minutes on the clock. Let's do this. I have one question. You said osteosclerotic. So osteoclerotic is something like thinning of the bone, right? Are you talking about osteolytic, bone lytic lesions in multiple myeloma?
Okay. Does anyone have any question? Yes or no? Dr. Tahira, do you have any question? Uh, yes, excuse me. Uh, tell me the osteoblastic is for what? I mean, it shows. Osteo osteoblastic is for prostatic carcinoma. Osteoblastic in the supine, right? In the spine, sorry. Oh. Osteoblastic in the vertebral spine, yes, in the bone. And osteosclerotic and or osteolytic, which is the same thing. It's for multiple myeloma. Okay, thank you. Okay. <clears throat> okay, is everyone ready? Yes or no? Okay. Acute APT demitis in young males. What is the organism? Chlamydia, 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 mycoplasma, chlamydia. Okay. Uh, okay. Do we have a new student with us today? Yes or no? Do we have a new student, Dr. Lata? Uh, do I know who you are? Is this your first class with us? Does anyone know uh, if Dr. Lata. Excuse me. Yes, 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 I joined today for the first time. Oh, okay. Is this, uh, okay, thank you so much. Are you a friend of anyone in the class? Uh, actually, I shared the link in a oh, okay. group. Okay, okay, good, good. Sorry. Okay. Nope, that's completely okay. Thank you so much for uh, allowing your friends to come and join. So thank you so much. I really appreciate that. That's no problem. Great, so this is your first class. Congratula uh, congratulations and thank you so much for joining the class. If you have any questions, let me know. Next one is acute prostatitis. Uh, what is the organism responsible for acute prostatitis? Please use the chat box to give me the answer. Acute prostatitis. Age, very good. Uh, let's say young age. Old equalized, young for the media measure. Yeah. Okay. Next one is in the BPH. Where do we get the hyperplasia? The lateral lobe, middle lobe, anterior lobe, posterior lobe. Where? Lateral and middle. Where do we get prostatic adenocarcinoma? Posterior lobe. Okay. Good. Very good. Okay. Now let's talk about. The, uh, let's talk about the reproductive pharmacology very quickly. Now, before I jump into the reproductive pharmacology, I just want to explain this diagram over here very quickly, okay? Now, while I explain this diagram, my handwriting is going to be really bad for the reason because I dropped my stylus pen in the coffee, so I'm gonna use my mouse to draw this, okay? So I apologize beforehand. Now, what I wanna to talk to you guys about is I wanna to talk to you guys about the hypothalamal pituitary gonadal axis, okay? A lot of our drugs in the reproductive pharmacology will have a role to play in the hypothalamal pituitary gonadal axis. Okay, so the first thing that I'm gonna draw over here is I'm gonna draw the anterior pituitary, okay? One second. Okay, let's say that this ball of a thing is the anterior pituitary. Over here, I'm gonna just only gonna write an H for hypothalamus, this is the pituitary gland. And over here, I'm gonna draw two things. For males, I'm gonna draw For males, should I draw the ovaries or the testes? Answer is testes. Okay, so the, those are the ovaries, and let's say that this is the this is the testes. Okay, now so what is the hypothalamus pituitary ovarian axis? First and foremost, the hypothalamus will stimulate the pituitary gland. How? Because they will release the gonadotropin releasing hormone GnRH. GnRH will then stimulate the will stimulate the ovaries and the testes by releasing luteinizing hormone and follicular stimulating hormone. If you remember anything from our last couple of days, which I know you guys do, luteinizing hormone and follicular stimulating hormone, they have a role to play in the testes and the ovaries. In the ovaries, the luteinizing hormone, they usually go to the theca interna, where the luteinizing hormone converts cholesterol and to androstenedione, that androstenedione moves from the theca interna to the granulosa cell, where the follicular stimulating hormone under the influence of the sertoli cell will convert the androstenedione to estron or estradiol with the help of aromatase enzyme. In the testis, the luteinizing hormone will work on the, on the um, leading cells, right? That is right outside of the testicle, 
of the, of the testicular cell and the leading cell will, will produce testosterone and that testosterone will stimulate the spermatogonia to mature into mature spermatocytes. Follicular stimulating hormone, however, will work on the sertoli cells, right? And when they work on the sertoli cells, they will convert and they will form a lot of inhibin and inhibin will, uh, will prevent the paramesonephric duct. I, I, I think I said the sertoli cell for, for the ovaries by a mistake. In the ovaries, you have Tika cell and the granulosa cell. In the, in the testes, you have the lytic cell and the sertoli cell, okay? So that's that. Now, so FSH and LH, they have a role to play over here in the ovaries and the Tika cell and the granulosa cell and the testes uh, on the lytic cell and the sertoli cell. So what happens over here? So the testes, they will stimulate um, the lytic cells to produce testosterone, right? So testosterone will be produced from over here. The testosterone will be produced from over here. This testosterone will be converted to dihydroxytestosterone. This testosterone will be converted to dihydroxytestosterone. How? Dihydroxytestosterone by the 5-alpha reductase. Very good. This dihydroxytestosterone will cause genetic expression. Yes or no? They will cause the secondary sexual characteristics. They will cause um, your um, male... Uh, the, they will basically cause all the secondary sexual characteristics of the males, meaning that muscle growth, you know, then widening of the shoulders, deepening of the voice, right? Hair growth or hair loss and everything else. So they will cause GE, GE for genetic expression. Okay, and that's that. Now in the females, what happens? GNRH, FSH and LH. LH will work on the Tika internal cells to, to form androstenedione. Androstenedione will then move from the Tika internal cell to the granulosa cell. In the granulosa cell, under the influence of FSH, the androstenedione will convert to estron with the help of which enzyme? Aromatase enzyme, yes or no? So the, in the ovaries, we have what? First and foremost, we have androstenedione, right? Androstenedione, where do we get androstenedione first? Tika cells or granulosa cells? Fast answers, please. We get androstenedione and Tika cells, very good. And then after that, the androstenedione is converted to estron in the granulosa cell, by which enzyme? by the aromatase enzyme, yes or no? They get converted to estron, and then that estron is then converted to estriol or estradiol, as simple as that. In the ovaries, they also produce a little bit of testosterone. It's not like they do not produce any testosterone. They produce a very little amount of testosterone, and that little amount of testosterone that's produced by the ovaries, they are also converted to estrogen by the same enzyme. That enzyme is aromatase, as simple as that. After that, these estrogen, do they cause the female secondary sexual characteristics? Yes or no? The answer is yes, right? Very good. Okay, so genetic expression. Okay, good. So over here, let's talk about the different sorts of drugs that have a role to play. Now, in PCOS, do we give a drug such as clomiphene citrate that acts as a GnRH agonist? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Okay, before I talk about this, before I talk about this, one more thing, very, very important. How many of us are aware that pulsatile stimulation, we have two types of stimulation of the anterior pituitary. We have two types of stim stimulation of the anterior pituitary, pulsatile and continuous. Pulsatile and continuous. Okay, now let me give you an example. How many of us over, how many of us, uh, how many of us over here? Um, okay, well, let me give you a better example. Um, okay. Um, look, do you remember when you, when you lived with your mother? Yes or no? Do we have anyone with whom their mother lives with them still? Yes or no? Their mother. Yes, good. Okay, Alhamdulillah. Very good. Now, my question is, do you know like how when we were growing up, our mothers would continuously ask us to do something? For example, they would ask us to clean our bed and we wouldn't clean our bed. And they would ask us to clean our bed, clean our bed, clean our bed, clean our bed. And then continuously, they would ask us to clean our bed and we will never clean our bed, right? So does that mean that, that if you push someone continuously, right? If you push someone continuously, there's a possibility they will not do, they will not do the job, yes or no? The answer is yes, right? But let's say if our father came and if they asked us to clean our bed once, once, or only once, right? Do we clean our bed or not? Yes or no? The answer is yes, right? So pulsatile, meaning that, meaning that 
meaning, what do we mean by pulsatile? Pulsatile means slow and sustained. Means slow and sustained. Continuous means continuously. So continuously, you keep on stimulating the, the organ. The thing is, when you give GnRH agonist in a pulsatile fashion, do you have more FSH and LH? Yes or no? That's the answer, please. The answer is yes. If you give GnRH in a continuous fashion, do you have more FSH LH or less FSH LH? Which one? The answer is you have less FSH and LH. Okay, good. I'm glad you guys understood this. So over here, there is a GnRH agonist that we give for PCOS. The GnRH agonist that we give for PCOS is clomiphene citrate. Yes or no? Clomiphene citrate. Clomiphene citrate is this GnRH agonist that we go that we give for PCOS in a in a pulsatile fashion or in a continuous fashion. Fast answer, please. It depends. Now, if you want to have you know in PCOS, is this a hypo? Is this a hyper estrogenic state? Yes or no? PCOS is PCOS a hyper estrogenic state or not? Yes or no? The answer is yes. So do we want more estrogen or less estrogen? Less estrogen, right? We want less, do we want less estrogen? So if you want to decrease the estrogen production, do you give the GnRH in a pulsatile fashion or a continuous fashion? The answer is you give them in a continuous fashion. But in a patient of PCOS, if you want to induce fertility, okay, try to understand what I'm saying. In a patient of PCOS, if you want to induce fertility by ovulating, uh, by inducing ovulate by inducing ovulation are you going to give this in a pulsating fashion or a, or a continuous pulsating fashion okay have i made myself clear yes or no yes okay good now tomifene is a gnrh agonist we have a gnrh antagonist the name of the gnrh antagonist is we have um luprolide luprolide more high yield luprolide Okay, Luprolide is very high yield. Then we have some more of these drugs. For example, Dr. Odero has said Degarelex, right? And then we also have Cosarelin. So these are not very high yield. Luprolide is very, very high yield. Okay, so Luprolide is there. Then after that, FSH and LH will go and work on the ovaries and testis. So let's talk about the testicular drugs first. Number one, the testis will stimulate the production of testosterone. This step over here could be blocked by ketoconazole and spironolactone. Ketoconazole and spironolactone. Do you guys remember how I told you that ketoconazole and spironolactone are an anti-androgenic drug? Yes or no? The answer is yes, right? Then testosterone to dihydroxytestosterone. Can we block them by giving 5-alpha reductase inhibitor finasteride? Yes or no? Finasteride. The answer is yes, right? So that's it. And, and the fact that the dihydroxytestosterone, it works on receptors and then it causes genetic expression. Do you guys remember how dihydroxytestosterone works? Dihydroxytestosterone, is this a lipophilic or lipophobic hormone? It's a steroid hormone, so it should be lipophilic, right? It's a lipophilic. So it can easily pass the cell membrane and once it enters the cytoplasm, would it bind with its androgen receptor? The answer is yes. After it binds with the androgen receptor, it forms an androgen receptor complex, which goes and it binds to the DNA Res, uh, DNA response element, right? They go and they enter the nucleus and they increase the transcription and translation of the proteins by working in the promoter regions of the DNA. So my question is, drugs such as spironolactone and there's another drug called flutamide, flutamide, flutamide and spironolactone, can they have anti-androgenic effect by blocking the androgen receptor? The answer is yes. Okay, so that's something I need you to understand. Okay, so these are all the testicular drugs. Let's talk about the drugs that work in the ovaries. Number one, we can decrease the production of androstenic dion in the theca cells by giving danazole. Do you guys remember danazole? Yes or no? Danazole, anti-estrogenic drug. Danazole is an anti-estrogenic drug. Then we can also get ketoconazole ketoconazole decreases androgen production. Next one is um, next one is um, your aromatase inhibitor. Aromatin, aromatase inhibitors are very important. We have anastrozole, letrozole, and eczemestine. We can, you can remember AL, A-L-E. Anastrozole, letrozole, and eczemestine. Eczemestine, these are all aromatase inhibitors. I'll talk about them in detail in first day. And then the way estrogen goes and estrogen works. Can we give tamoxifene and raloxifene? Yes or no? The answer is yes. These are 
S-E-R-M-S, meaning they are selective estrogen receptor modulator, meaning that they cause estrogen agonist, agonistic activity in some areas and estrogen antagonistic activities in another area. So that's them. So that's all about the reproductive drugs and their introduction. Now let's jump into the text over here. Okay, just give me one second. Give me one second. Okay. Give me one quick second, please. Okay. So we have discussed this diagram. So let me move forward to, to this page over here now. First and foremost, how are we going to read the reproductive system? For the drugs that are excessively, extremely high yield that will be asked in step one exam, I'm going to use my red pen. And for the drugs that are not as important, I'm going to use my blue pen. Now, for the first one, luprolide, cosarelin, and hysterelin. Now, for this, I'm going to use my blue pen. They're high yield, but not as much. That is, you do not get a lot of questions from this one. Luprolide, cosarelin, and hysterelin, these are GnRH agonists when used in pulsatile fashion. Okay, so that's important. When used in continuous fashion, they act as GNAs. They act primarily as GN, GnRH agonists, but subsequently they become GnRH antagonists. So that's it. So decrease FSH and LH in a continuous fashion. Now, where do we use GnRH agonists and antagonists? We can use this pulsatile for, always remember, GnRH agonists used are used in pulsatile fashion for pregnancy. Okay, are used for pregnancy. For continuous fashion, if we give them in continuous fashion, can we decrease estrogen production? The answer is yes. So can we give them for uh, estrogenic carcinoma, such as breast and uterine carcinoma? The answer is yes, okay? So adverse effects will depend how you give it. If you give it in a pulsatile fashion, you can get increase of libido. If you give it in a continuous fashion, you can get decrease of libido and hypogonadism. So, so the adverse effects over here will vary for pulsatile and continuous fashion, so that's it. Next one is Dega relics. Once again, not high yield. Okay, blue pen, not high yield. Not a lot of questions are being asked from over here. It's a GnRH antagonist. It directly antagonizes the GnRH receptor, no startup. We can give them for prostatic cancer. It causes hot flashes and liver toxicity, not important. Okay, you do not need to do, remember this as much because for prostate cancer, we do not use Dega relics. And the group of choice of drugs are alpha-1 antagonist, phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitor, and 5-alpha reductive inhibitor, okay? We do not use GnRH antagonists for prostatic carcinoma as of, uh, I mean, uh, we do not use, we use these drugs for uh, benign prostatic hyperplasia and prostatic carcinoma. But for Degarelix, we do not use it as much for prostatic carcinoma. But having said that, since it's already in first year, maybe you can try to remember this by remembering the word PD. PD for police department or PD for prostatic carcinoma is treated by Dega relics, PD, that's all you need to remember. Dega relics, where do we use it? Prostatic carcinoma. If you want to remember this, then that's the only thing you can remember. Next one is estrogen. Estrogen is excessively high yield. Estrogen will be asked in your step one exam. Estrogen has two active forms, ethanol estradiol, diethylstilbestrol, or mestranol. They bind to the estrogen receptor, which is an androgenic receptor. Where do we use this? We use the estrogenic receptor. Can we use this, for example, uh, to... Um, for example, can we use estrogen from outside as an OCP? Yes or no, oral contraceptive pill. The answer is yes. When we give estrogen from outside, what happens? Do we decrease the normal hypothalamus pituitary gonadal axis uh, mechanism? Yes or no? The answer is yes. So if that happens, do we have more estrogen and, and or less estrogen eventually that is produced by our own body? More or less? We get less. Very good. So we can use this in OCP in a combined method with progesterone. So that's how OCPs, they usually work. <clears throat> so that's right. Another thing over here is, um, okay. And another thing over here is that estrogen can also be used for ovarian failure or menstrual abnormalities. For example, let's say we have someone with PCOS. If we have someone with PCOS, do we prescribe them OCP? Yes or no? The answer is, the answer is yes. Another thing, very quickly, anyone who has, I need you to understand one thing very clearly. 
if there is a patient who has menorrhagia, metorrhagia due to fibroid, endometriosis, adenomyosis, or um, let's say Asherman syndrome or like anything else, when they undergo menstruation, is that really painful and really difficult for them once a month? Yes or no? Answer is yes. So do we want to give them OCP to make sure that they do not have menstruation once a month? Yes or no? The answer is yes. So these patients, initially, if, if they come to your office with these sort of problems, can you prescribe them PCOS? to make sure that they do not have their menstruation? The answer is yes, because whenever they have their menstruation, for example, if it's endometriosis and the endometrial glands, let's say, are in the um, ovaries, every month when they bleed, can they have severe adnexal pain? Yes or no? The answer is yes. So that's it. So we give them for menstrual abnormalities and hormone replacement therapy in postmenopausal female. In postmenopausal female, we can also give them these things to decrease what? To decrease the menopausal symptoms. What, is, what are the perimenopausal symptoms? Hot flashes, anxiety, mood, hypertension, and all of those things, right? So that's that. Can we also give them for osteoporosis? Yes or no? Estrogen for osteoporosis? The answer is. The answer is estrogen is also given for osteoporosis. But what are the adverse effects? The number one adverse effect of giving estrogen from outside, from, uh, from outside or anywhere else is increased risk of endometrial cancer. This is this is especially when, when we give an OCP that, com that contains only estrogen. If we give an OCP that contains estrogen and progesterone, then the risk of endometrial cancer is very low. If we give only estrogen, then the risk of endometrial cancer is very high. Okay, so that's it. So bleeding in postmenopausal patients are also seen, adenocarcinoma of the vagina and everything else. And always remember, estrogen and progesterone are thrombotic drugs. They are thrombotic drugs. They will cause a DVT, deep vein thrombosis. Now, if there is a patient who is above the age of 35, a female patient who is a smoker, are you, are you going to give them OCPs? Yes or no? The answer is no. Okay, so that's it. Can you also give uh, OCP? If a patient has have breast cancers or like anything else, the answer is no, right? Yes. Breast, <clears throat> especially breast cancers, if they are estrogen receptor positive, then they will cause more harm than good. Okay. The history of DVD <coughs> will be asked in your step one exam. And this is very, very important. Do we also stop prescribing uh, uh, tamoxifene, duloxifene for patients who have um, <coughs> DVD? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. okay, good. Then the next one is SERMS, Selective Estrogen Receptor Modulator, SERMS, S-E-R-M-S. Selective Estrogen Receptor Modulator, we have known the number one that we have is clomiphene. Clomiphene is considered to be estrogen receptor modulator. Why? Because it's a GnRH agonist. If we gave clomiphene in a continuous fashion, do we have more FSH and LH? Yes or no? The answer is no. If we gave clomiphene in a continuous, in a, in a positive fashion, do we have more FSH and LH? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Okay. So antagonists, they are antagonists as estrogen receptor in the hypothalamus, and they can also act as an agonist, depending on how you give this. Prevents normal feedback inhibition and increases the release of FSH and LH from the periphery, which stimulates the ovulation. It's used to treat infertility due to anovulation. Okay, it's used to treat infertility due to anovulation. It may cause hot flash, ovarian enlargement, and multiple simultaneous pregnancy and visual disturbance. But the thing is, when you compare clomiphene with tamoxifene and tamoxifene, clomiphene usually will receive a blue, and the tamoxifene and, and tamoxifene will receive reds because they are very, very high yield, especially tamoxifen. What is tamoxifen? It's a selective estrogen receptor modulator. The word selective estrogen receptor, meaning that, <clears throat> that these drugs will selectively act as an antagonist in some estrogen receptor, and they will work as an agonist in other estrogenic receptors. For example, tamoxifen acts as an estrogenic antagonist at the breast, but agonist at the uterus. So my question is, if there is a estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, do we give them estrogen or estrogen antagonist? Which one? That chance, please. We give them estrogen, agonist or antagonist? Antagonist, very good, very good. So for tamoxifene, if it works as an estrogen antagonist in the breast, 
Is this a good choice of drug for ER positive breast cancer? Yes or no? The answer is yes. But if, if a patient has a history of a uterine problem, let's say fibroid or PCOS or history of endometrial hyperplasia, are you going to give them tamoxifene? Yes or no? The answer is no, right? So that's that. So always remember this. We usually give tamoxifene to patients. For example, if there's a patient who has a history of hysterectomy, they do not even have uh, a uterus. In these patients, is it okay to give tamoxifen? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Okay. So they, because tamoxifen can cause hot flash, DVT, endometrial cancer, <clears throat> and it's used to prevent recurrence of ER positive breast cancer to prevent gynecomastia. And that's that. We also give tamoxifen for males. Sometimes we give tamoxifen for males. Why? Because males who are being treated with finasteride, do they have high DHT or low DHT? The answer is they have low DHT with finasteride. So the excessive testosterone in males, can they get converted to estrogen? Yes or no? The answer is yes. And can that cause gynecomastia in males? The answer is yes. So can we give them tamoxifene because they work as an estrogen antagonist in the breast? The answer is yes. Very good. Okay. Before I move on to raloxifene, who has questions? Please write me in the chat box. Who has questions? Yes, Dr. BK, please unmute yourself and ask me the question. Uh, yes, doctor. Actually, you told me uh, ER and PR positive, we can uh, prescribe tamoxifen. In which condition we are not uh, not going to prescribe the tamoxifen? Is it we, will not we will not prescribe tamoxifen to a patient who has estrogen receptor breast cancer with a history of endometrial hyperplasia, fibrosis, familial history of endometrial carcinoma, DVT, smokers, um, endometriosis, any menstrual problem, we will not give them tamoxifen. Why? Okay. Because they increase the risk of uterine bleeding or uterine hyperplasia. That's that. Another thing is, uh, another thing that I wanted to say is, um, oh, who do we give tamoxifen to? We give tamoxifen to patients who do not have a uterus. For example, who has hysterectomy, for instance, that's that. Or, the next thing is, if there is a patient who has estrogen receptor breast cancer, but they have normal uterus, they have no problem in their uterus, are you going to give them tamoxifen? The answer is yes. yes. But when you give them tamoxifen, do you have to do monthly transvaginal ultrasonogram to see uterine thickness? The answer is yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, good. Okay. Next one. Thank Dr. You. Dr. Sana, what question do you have? Yes, Dr. Hedri, regarding ER positive breast cancer, uh, do we give estrogen or not? I mean, we, we no, do we not, do give, not give estrogen. Give, no, 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 no. We do not give estrogen. We give anti estrogen. All right. Okay, got it. Okay. Thank you. If a breast cancer is ER positive, PR positive, HER2 positive, then it's easy to treat them because we can only stop the estrogen from outside, preventing estrogen, uh, preventing giving the estrogen, and that will decrease the size of the tumor. But if a breast cancer is not ER positive, PR positive, and HER2 positive, it's very difficult to treat them because we're already taking away one option of treatment. So we directly have to treat them with chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and surgery. Okay. <clears throat> now let's move on to raloxifene. What is raloxifene? This is the same SERM, except they act as estrogen antagonists at the breast and the uterus together, but they also act as estrogen agonists at the bone. So my question is, can we give Raloxifene, isn't this a good choice of drug for then tamoxifene? The answer is yes. And um, if someone has, let's say, breast cancer with osteoporosis, is, is raloxifene a very good choice of drug for these patients? The answer is yes, right? Another thing is, can we also give raloxifene only to treat female osteoporosis? Yes or no? The answer is Yes, so primarily we give raloxifene because it's an estrogen antagonist at the breast, an agonist at the bone to treat osteoporosis. But once again, we have to keep in mind that raloxifene is an SERM. So patients who have DVT, patients who have um, your, who are having OCPs and everything else, they need to be very careful because they can have DVT, okay? Now, very quickly, I just wanna talk about this. If someone has a deep vein thrombosis, can they have pulmonary embolism? The answer is yes. What are the signs and symptoms of pulmonary embolism? Do they have sudden onset of shortness of breath and severe chest pain? The answer is 
he has bread, cut an ounce of bread and severe chest pain. And if it's a female, they come to your clinic. If you do an EKG, right? If you do an EKG, what do you find? Do you find S1, Q3, T3 mechanism of ECG change? Who knows this S1, Q3, T3 mechanism of ECG change? This is an EKG for your pulmonary embolism. We see S waves in, in lead one, Q waves in lead three, and P waves in lead three. This is called S1, Q3, T3 mechanism. This is what we see in an EKG of a patient who has pulmonary embolism. I'll talk about this next week when I start the respiratory system. So that's that. And another thing that we can do to quickly diagnose the pulmonary embolism is what the choice of uh, investigation is. The choice of investigation is CT and geography. We do a CT and geography. And when we do a CT and geograph, do we see a uh, saddle thrombus in the pulmonary trunk? Yes or no? The answer is yes. And then immediately, do we have to remove the thrombus? The answer is yes. Okay, so that's it. So that's all about tamoxifene and raloxifene. Let's move down to aromatase inhibitors. Is everyone ready? Yes or no? Is everyone ready for aromatase inhibitors? Aromatase inhibitors, is everyone else? Yes, okay. So now let's talk about aromatase inhibitors. For your aromatase inhibitors, please give a red star mark for anastrozole, leprozole, and exdenestine, AO. These drugs, they prevent the conversion of estrogen from, I mean, they prevent the conversion of testosterone to estrogen, right? And these drugs, they are ER positive. We give them for ER positive breast cancer, right? So if we have low estrogen, if we have low estrogen, is it better for ER positive breast cancer? The answer is yes. Okay, so that's it. So a lot of students, they have difficulty in remembering the aromatase inhibitors and their names, but if you have to remember this, just remember AL, ALE, anastrozole, letrozole, and exemestine. Okay, from these three drugs, anastrozole, letrozole, and exemestine, letrozole is very widely mentioned in your U world, and sometimes <clears throat> they mention exemestine. So letrozole is a very common drug, okay? That's that. Now let's move on to hormone replacement therapy. Is everyone ready? Yes or no? Hormone replacement therapy. Hormone replacement therapy is the replacement of estrogen and progesterone to a patient who has no estrogen and progesterone, right? For example, for postmenopausal female, Turner syndrome, patients who have ovarian dysgenesis, patients who, have, um, who are having menopause, who has primary ovarian insufficiency or premature ovarian failure. In all of these patients, we can give hormone replacement therapy, and this is a star drug. It's used to relieve prevention of menopausal symptoms, very high yield, that are hot flattered vaginal atrophy. And uh, we give them <clears throat> to, uh, the, because there are, because unopposed estrogen receptor activity increases the risk of endometrial cancer. So this is something, uh, this is another thing which we have to make sure, right? For example, uh, if you give a postmenopausal female estrogen, isn't there a possibility that that, that, that can cause um, endometrial hydroplasia and endometrial, endometrial cancer in these patients? Yes or no? The answer is, the answer is yes, right? So to, to make sure that they do not develop endometrial hydroplasia, do we have to make sure that patients do transvaginal ultrasonogram every one to one, one to three months, especially postmenopausal females? So that's that. So we have to be very careful, that's that. Another thing is, should they also do monthly or three monthly D-dimer to see the level of the, the level of risk for the thrombus formation, yes or no? B dimers, the answer is yes, because they also increase the risk of DVTs. So that's that. Next one is progestins or progesterone or progestins. These are levonorgestrel, medoxyprogesterone, and that's that. Okay, very quickly, I just want to ask you guys, in the US, what is the number one method of contraception if the females do not have any uterine abnormalities? Fast answers, please. If females do not have uterine abnormalities, what is the number one? OCPS is not the number one mode of contraception. Can anyone tell me what is the number one mode of contraception? It's not combined OCP. It's not combined OCP. Number one is, number one is, no, not even pop, not even pop. This is copper containing intrauterine devices, CIUCD, copper containing intrauterine devices for the US, the number one mode of contraception. Then after that, if that is not working, we can also give levonorgestrel containing intrauterine device. Levonorgestrel containing intrauterine device. If that doesn't work, then we can give OCPs or POP. 
progesterone only pills. Okay. Have I made myself clear? Yes or no? Okay. No. So levonorgestrel, medoxyprogesterone, these are all the subtypes of your progestins. They bind to the progesterone receptor, they decrease the growth and increase the vascularization of the endometrium. So, and do you guys remember that whenever the uh, uterus is gravid, right? Do we have a lot of progesterone? Yes or no? The answer is yes, right? First, the progesterone is produced by the corpus luteum of pregnancy. Then the progesterone is produced by the placenta. Do you remember I told you that physiologically, a gravid uterus needs progesterone. Why? Because progesterone is responsible for increasing the vascularization and deciduous formation of the endometrium. And another thing is that the progesterone, does it, does it cause thickening of the cervical mucus? Yes or no? The answer is yes. So if there is any female who is getting involved in sexual activity after they become gravid, can that prevent future fertilization? Can that prevent future fertilization? Yes or no? The answer is yes, right? So it's important for, for the progesterone level to be very high. Have I made myself clear, yes or no? Okay. Then they're used for contraception, they're used for endometrial carcinoma, abnormal uterine bleeding, and progesterone challenge pills. Uh, what is progestin challenge? Pro progestin challenge is presence of bleeding upon withdrawal of progestin. Okay, now let me tell you something. Why do we have, why do women have monthly menstruation? Uh, during the entire uh, month of menstruation, just before the menstruation begins, the, is, is the progesterone responsible for increasing, for increasing the vascularization of the uterine endometrium during the secretory phase? The answer is yes. During the secretory phase, the progestin is responsible for increasing the vascularity. Then all of a sudden, if the female do not have fertilization or implantation, is there a sudden drop of, of progesterone? Yes or no? There's a sudden drop of progesterone. That sudden drop of progesterone, is it responsible for the breaking down of the uterine endometrium? The answer is yes, right? Now, is this also why the sudden drop of progesterone is responsible for the mood changes in the um, premenstrual dysphoria? Yes or no? Premenstrual dysphoria, the answer is yes. Okay, now my question is, if there is a female who has fibrosis of the uterus, right? In Asherman syndrome, if they have fibrosis of the uterus in Asherman syndrome, in a progestin challenge test, will there be withdrawal bleeding? Yes or no? The answer is no. So can we use this to diagnose uterine fibrosis and synechiae? The answer is yes. Okay. Very important. So progestin challenge, presence of bleeding upon, upon, upon the withdrawal of progestin excludes anatomical defects such as Asherman syndrome and chronic anovulation. Very important, very, very important. Okay, so estrogen and progesterone, very important. Okay. Very quickly, what are the three drugs that we give for abortion? Does anyone know all the three drugs we give for abortion? M, M, M. Methotrexate, mesoprostol, and methy, methy, pristone. Methotrexate, mesoprostol, methy, pristone. What is methy, pristone? Methy, pristone, and ulipristone. Okay, do you guys know about this one drug that, is, that we can give in 72 hours and um, this can prevent pregnancy emergency contraception? Yes or no? One drug that we can give. Uh, okay. No, that's not metricristone. I'm not really sure, but I'm pretty sure these drugs are available in all, in all countries, right? Have you guys heard the name of ulipristal acetate? They sell this in multiple Asian countries. The name of the drug is Puli. Pewee. Okay. I'm not really sure if you guys have heard the name of, uh, of, the, of the drug, but the name of the, the name, the brand name is Pewee. The active ingredient is ulipristal acetate, which is a progesterone antagonist. Okay. This is very, very important. Very, very important. You need to know this. This will be asked in your injury exam. Ulipristal. Ulipristal is that emergency contraceptive drug that we can only give one that we can only give one and we can give them uh, within 72 to 96 hours to make sure that pregnancy is not happening. So it's an inhibitor of the progestins and that's that and we use them for abortion for, for the termination. And metipristone is also an um, unwanted 72, there's a brand in India, okay good. Unwanted 72. Unwanted 72 
drug lean. So this is not uniprestol. This is not uniprestol. Okay. Okay. This is uniprestol. This is uniprestol. Uniprestol acetate. Oh. Now, where were we? Uh, we were talking about antiprogestins and terminations of pregnancy. So that's it. Okay. Does anyone have any question? Yes or no? Yes, Dr. Odara, what question do you have? Yes, thank you, Doctor. Uh, I have a question. Can you repeat, please, the progestin use in patients uh, with um, endometrial um, vascularization increase or, or fibroids that you mentioned? Okay. Okay. Wait. Do not leave. Okay. So just just say yes or no. Uh, during menstruation, under the influence of progesterone, do we have vascularization of the uterus or not? Yes. Yes. Right when females are about to have menstruation, do they have menstruation because there's no fertilization and implantation? Correct, yes. Yes. So when there's no fertilization and implantation, do we have corpus luteum of pregnancy and placenta? No. No. So what happens to the progesterone level? Does it fall or does it increase? It fall. If it falls, then does the endometrial layer break down? Yes. When it breaks down, is that when the females experience menstruation? Correct, yes. Very good. And now the, my question is, can we see this sort of withdrawal bleeding in Asherman syndrome? The answer is no. Why? Because in Asherman syndrome, the uterus is fibrosed. Correct. Okay. Okay. So that's 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 what I said. Yeah. Correct. Thank you for clarifying. I, I just want to add something. You you mentioned the when the hormonal replacement therapy is uh, being established or prescribed, patient has to have I mean need to be monitorized with the yes. ultrasounds. Not all patients, postmenopausal patients. Uh -huh. Okay, post the reason is because of the increase of uh, endometrial growth. Growth, okay. It has yeah. to have a monitorization of the thickening yes. of the endometrium. Okay, yes. Okay, thank yeah. you. Okay, you're welcome. Now, let's move on to combined contraception. Is everyone ready? A quick yes or no in the chat box, please. Is everyone ready? Quick yes or no in the chat box. Okay, good. So combined contraception, we have progestins and ethanol estradiol. They are, they are made by combining progestins and, and estrogen. My question is, if you make a combined OCP with only estrogen, is that risky or not risky? Fast answers. That is very risky. Yes, because if you only make, um, if you only make a contraceptive pill that contains only estrogen, isn't there a possibility that there could be severe risk of carcinoma DVD? The answer is yes. So when we give estrogen and progestins together, can they block the GnRH production as a whole? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Can they block uh, the can they block FSH and LH? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Together. So estrogen and progesterone together, when they're given together, they will inhibit FSH and LH and prevent further estrogen surge. So no estrogen surge means no ovulation, as simple as that. And the progestin will cause thickening of the cervical mucus. Always remember this, guys, please, please remember this, that progesterone will, will cause thickening of the cervical mucus. And when the cervical mucus is thickened, the sperm cannot enter into the uterus. So that's very important. So pro progestins also inhibit endometrial proliferation. That's another one. That's the endometrium is less viable to the implantation of an embryo. That is the progestins that we give from outside. Always remember this. The progestins that we give from outside will inhibit endometrial proliferation. Progesterone that is produced from inside of the body, they will cause endometrial vascularization. Adverse effects are that patients can experience breakthrough bleeding, venous thromboembolism, very high yield. Another thing that I want to get everyone's attention to is that in your US Assembly step one or step two CK, you will have a female. Do I have everyone's attention? Yes or no? The everyone's attention, a very important question will be asked. You will have a female of reproductive age who is having OCP will come to your clinic with severe right upper abdominal pain. Okay. If there's a patient, especially a female who comes to your clinic with a severe right upper abdominal pain, the first thing that comes to our mind is what? Oh, it's a female. The female is in a reproductive age. Let's say the female is a little bit overweight. The first one is 
not ectopic. We never think of ectopic pregnancy. We never think of ectopic pregnancy. We do not think of adenoma. When there's a fat female fertile patient, fat female fertile patient, FFF, what do we think about? Very good. We think about gallbladder problems, gallstones. So what do we do? When we think that it's a gallstone, the first provisional diagnosis in our mind is gallstone. Do we do an ultrasound immediately? Do we do an ultrasound? The answer is yes. We do an ultrasound. And when we do the ultrasound, we see that in the liver, we have this sort of a growth. Let's say this is the, this, this is the liver. There's a smooth enlargement or a smooth growth of the liver in a patient who has been having OCT for a long period of time. The name of this growth is called a subcapsular hematoma. As, I mean, sub capsular liver adenoma, subcapsular liver adenoma. Why do we get subcapsular liver adenoma? We get this because, you know like how the liver is responsible for breaking down estrogen and progesterone, yes or no? The liver is the main metabolized organism. The answer is yes. So there could be hyperplasia. For example, if you're getting estrogen and progesterone from outside, will the liver have to work twice as much to break down the estrogen and the progesterone, yes or no? The answer is? The answer is yes. So, so can they cause a little bit of hyperplasia of the, of the hepatic cells? Can there be hyperplasia of the hepatic cells? The answer is yes. That hyperplasia is seen as an adenoma like this. So in these patients who has a subcapsular adenoma, do you have to stop the OCP? The answer is yes. Stop the OCP, wait for the adenoma to get obliterated or degenerated, and then you can start the OCP again. Okay, and then you can start the OCP again. And another question is, subcapsular adenomas like this one, is there a possibility that they can turn into carcinomas? Yes or no? The answer is, the answer is yes. There's a very low chance, one to 2% chance that they can convert into carcinomas. Have I made myself clear? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Okay, yes. So hepatic adenoma, very important. Very, very important. Yes. So contraindications are people about 35 years of age who smoke, who has a risk of heart heart disease, familial history of DVT and migraines, right? Why don't we not give um, OCP to migraine to people who have migraines? Because OCP can enhance migraine because OCP contains argets. Argot, it's an argot alkaloid containing compound. So oh, that's that. So that's that. Breast cancer and, and liver disease are also areas where we do not give OCP, right? So that's that. Have I made myself clear, yes or no? Have I made myself clear? Yes. No. No. Good. Oh. So do you guys want to take a short 15 minute break before we move on to CICUV and the last page? Yes or no? Then we can do a quick revision of what we have studied. Okay. Yes. Is everyone ready for a break or do you guys want, want me to continue? Which one? <clears throat> Does everyone, is everyone ready for a break? Dr. Otero, do you have a question for me? Yes or no? Yes, doctor. Why you don't give it in the mic? Just give me one second. Oh. Yes, I'm sorry, Dr. Otero. My apologies. Your question is what? Why you don't give a combined contrast? Wait, okay, why we do not give OD, uh, OCP in migraines is because when we give OCP in, in people who have migraines, then that poses an increased risk for them to have strokes. Because in migraines, we have, uh, we, we already give, um, for example, in migraines, do we give drugs that causes vasodilatation or vasoconstriction? <clears throat> the answer is we give drugs that causes vasoconstriction, right? Because vasodilatation causes headache. So we give drugs that cause vasodilatation. So, if, if the vessels of the brains are already vasoconstricted under the influence of anti-migraine drugs, then can OCP also cause an increased risk of blood clogging up because OCP can cause blood thickening, I mean, thickening, I mean, OCP can cause uh, venous thromboembolism, yes or no? Yes. 
Okay, so isn't there an increased possibility for the patient to have stroke with the vasoconstrictor and the OCT? Yes, mm -hmm. there is. Right, so, so that's why we do not give patients who have migraine, we do not give them OCT. Okay, okay. thank you. You're welcome. Now, is everyone ready for the break? Yes or no? Or, or do I continue? Uh, chances, please. Okay, so let's take a break for 15 minutes and then let's come back. Thank you.
Okay, is everyone back from their break? Can you guys hear my voice? Yes or no? Is everyone back from their break? Can you guys hear my voice? <clears throat> Okay, give me one second and then let's begin. Okay, good. So we are done talking about the combined contraceptive devices. Now let's start the discussion from CIUCD, right? copper containing intrauterine device. Now, what is the mechanism of the action of the copper containing intrauterine devices? First and foremost, in the US, this is one of the number one major modes of contraception, right? This produces local inflammatory reaction that is toxic to the sperm and ova and they prevent fertilization and implantation. This is high yield. Clinical use, we act this for long acting reversible contraception. And this is the most effective emergency contraception. Most effective emergency contraception. So if you're given a choice to choose between this and Ulipristo, which one will you choose? Best chances? Very good. Now the question is, if there's a female who has a uterine structural abnormality, are you going to give them CIUCDs? Yes or no? The answer is no. Always remember this. Anyone who has dysmenorrhea, menorrhagia, metorrhagia, do not give them. PID, do not give them. Okay, so that's it. Another thing is, if the female is not, is not careful, is there, a, is there a possibility that there could be uterine puncture? Yes or no? The answer is yes. So we have to be careful. I'm not sure why this is very widely used in the US because in, in our countries, we do not use IUCDs anymore. I'm not really sure why IUCDs are so uh, effective in the US, but it beats me. But since it, it is what it is, then we have to know, okay? Next one is tocolytics. For tocolytics, you have to remember, it's not my time. What does it mean by it's not my time? Meaning that when the baby, is ready to get out of the uterus. If the baby is ready to get out of the uterus, can I say it's not my time, yes or no? That it's not the time for the baby to get out, okay? So with E, you have endomethacin. With N, you have nifedipine. With M, you have magnesium sulfate. With P, you have terbutaline. It's not my time. Have I made myself clear, yes or no? Yes. Okay. So medications that will relax the uterus, they will cause uterine relaxations because when we have uterine contraction, then that's when we have the, um, that's when the baby is, is able to come out very easily. So we relax the uterus by giving terbutaline, which is a beta-2 agonist, Beta-2 agonists, they cause relaxations. Nifedipine, which is a calcium channel blocker, they cause smooth muscle vasodilatation. Endomethacine, they decrease the production of prostaglandin, which is also a vasodilator. But we, oh, we also give magnesium sulfate. That's also another one. It's used to decrease the contraction and frequency in preterm labor and allow, and allow time for administration of the, of the other drugs. Okay, so that's that. Uh, while we give the fetus, for example, let's say that a mother is having active contractions. <clears throat> let's say that a mother is having active contractions uh, at, let's say, 32 weeks of gestation. Is there a possibility that the fetus can have underdeveloped lungs? Yes or no? The answer is, the answer is yes. So in that case, while we give the mother endomethacin, nifedipine, terbutamine, and magnesium sulfate, can we give them steroids for the production of uh, surfactants? The answer is yes. Okay. By the way, do we also give uh, interpartum penicillin to prevent uh, neonatal sepsis? Yes or no? The answer is 
yes. Very important. Okay. So oh. next one is danazole. Danazole is also a very important drug. Danazole is that it, this is a it is a synthetic androgen that acts as a partial agonist. It's, a, it's an estrogenic agonist. When do we use a danazole? We give danazole for endometriosis. How does it help in endometriosis? <clears throat> if we give estrogen from outside, this decreases the normal hypothalamus pituitary gonadal axis activity, and patients can have alleviation of their symptoms. We can also give them for hereditary angio angioedema, but it's not very widely used. So I'm not going to mention this. Adverse effects, you can get weight gain, <clears throat> edema, acne, parasitism, <clears throat> and masculinization because danazole is an androgen. It's not an, it's not an estrogen receptor. It's not an estrogen. It's an androgen, right? So we give danazole for these things over here. Another thing is that danazole can cause hepatotoxicity. Why? Because all the androgens in the body, they're broken down in the liver. So high amount of danazole can cause hepatotoxicity. Another thing, please remember, do you guys remember female toad? Female toad, P-O-A-D. When do we use this mnemonic female toad? When do we use this mnemonic female toad? Female toad, when do we use this? Inter increase idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Risk factors for idiopathic intracranial hypertensions are female, females who use tetracycline, obese females, then A for what? A for vitamin A derivatives, yes or no? That is, that is retinoic acid and isoretinoin, D for danazole, D for danazole. Danazole can cause idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Very high yield, <clears throat> okay? Next one is testosterone. Testosterone is uh, understandable. It's not that high yield. It's basically an agonist of the androgen receptor. We treat this for, for hypogonadism and development of secondary sexual characteristics. Adverse effect wise, we can get masculinization in females, <clears throat> decreased testosterone in males by inhibiting the release of GH. Now, who are the patient population who will abuse testosterone? Are they bodybuilders? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Athletes? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Okay. So that's that. Another thing is testosterone will cause increase of LDL. That's, an, that's another. So it's, an, it's a pro-cholesterol promoting drug, meaning that it will, prom, it will promote cholesterol. That's that. Okay, that's that. Now, let's talk about the antiandrogens. Is everyone ready? Yes or no? Antiandrogens? Okay. Antiandrogens, the drugs that are important are finasteride, spironolactone, glutamide. Okay, so let's talk about these three drugs first. Finasteride, we know that it's a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. We give them for BPH and male pattern baldness. Now, males, are they bald because they have a lot of testosterone? Yes or no? The answer is yes. This is why all of the major professional bodybuilders, they have no hair. Okay. Uh, have you guys been to Egypt or do we have anyone from Egypt by any, by, by any chance? Is there, is, there, is there anyone over here from Egypt? Egypt. <clears throat> is there anyone over here from Egypt? Yes or no? No, okay. So basically what I'm trying to tell you is in Egypt, there was a mild prevalence of increased use of testosterone where uh, bodybuilders and athletes, they were using a lot of testosterone. And uh, all... All of a sudden, the prevalence of male pattern boneless, especially in Egypt, started rising in 2016 and 2017. Now, is it due to the fact that they were abusing testosterone? Yes or no? The answer is yes, right? So that means that increase of testosterone can cause male pattern baldness. So if we give a drug that prevents testosterone from being active, can we decrease male pattern baldness? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Okay, that's that. Next one is flutamide. Flutamide is a competitive estrogen receptor antagonist, right? Do you remember androgen receptor complex that we use, that the, 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 the testosterone use to increase their transcription and translation? Can we block it with flutamide? Yes or no? The answer is yes. So flutamide is given for prostatic carcinoma. Do you guys remember we also give what? PD for prostatic carcinoma. Well, what was the name of the drug for D that we gave for prostatic carcinoma? Police department, which I have just said a little bit, a little while ago. What is the name of the drug? Degar relics, very good, okay. So there's another drug that we can give that is flutamide. So which one, which one will you give first? First, 
glutamide or Dega relics? Which one will you give first, glutamide or Dega relics? Flutamide, you will give flutamide first, then you will give Dega relics. Okay. Are we clear, yes or no? Why? Because flutamide is more effective, that's why. Okay. Okay. Next one is spironolactone. How many of us knows what spironolactone is? Spironolactone is a diuretic, yes or no? <clears throat> is spironolactone a diuretic? The answer is yes, right? Spironolactone is an antigen receptor and a 17 alpha hydroxylase inhibitor. So if you block 17 alpha hydroxylase, can you get androgen? Yes or no? The answer is no. So flutamide, how does it work? Flutamide is a 17 alpha hydroxylase inhibitor, as simple as that. Okay, so we give them for PCOS and that's that. Now, the thing is we do not give spironolactone primarily for PCOS. We give spironolactone because it's a potassium sparing diuretic. So the so major cause is we give it for diuretic patients, patients who are getting diuretic, um, for patients who has, um, for example, who is taking diuretics, but they also have hypokalemia. So these are the patient populations who will get spinolactone. Now let's talk about two other drugs that's not very high yield. Let's talk about uh, abiraterone, abiraterone and ketoconazole. Abiraterone is also a 17 alpha hydroxylase inhibitor. We can give them, we can give them for prostatic cancer, but it's not very high yield. Ketoconazole is uh, an antifungal drug, and we can also give for prostatic for prostatic carcinoma, but it's not very high yield. So to sum up, for prostatic cancer, we give four drugs. Number one, flutamide, excessively high yield. Then we can give Dega relics. <clears throat> we can give ketoconazole and abiraterone. Abiraterone. From over here, flutamide is the number one choice. If that doesn't work, then we can go for Dega relics. We have two other drugs in our hands. If we want, we can give this. We, we can give them but we usually choose not to, as simple as that. Next one is tamsulosin. What is tamsulosin? Tamsulosin is something that we gave this in BPH. It's high yield. It's an alpha one antagonist that causes smooth muscle vasodilatation. Smooth muscle vasodilatation. By inhibiting smooth muscle contraction, we get smooth muscle vasodilatation. That's all you need to remember. And the last one is minoxidil. Minoxidil is, is given, minoxidil is actually high yield. It's a vasodilator. We give minoxidil for androgenetic alopecia. This is male pattern baldness that is that has a genetic uh, predisposition. That is, the father had male pattern baldness. The child will also have male pattern baldness. It's not due to increase of testosterone. It's due to genetic reasons. Have I made myself clear? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. Good. So, with that being said, congratulations. You are done with the reproductive system, which you have completed. Now, very quickly, before I complete the reproductive system and I end the class, today we are not going to do any more AMBOSS questions. I'm going to end the class very soon. But I'm going to give you guys five minutes to go through the drugs which I have put a star mark, which the drugs which I have put a star mark beside. I'll need you to go through estrogen, aromatase inhibitor, HRT, progestin, CIU, CD, danazole, tamsulosin, and minoxidil. How long do you guys, how long will you guys need to go through these drugs, fast answers, please? How long do you guys need to go through these drugs? Can you guys hear my voice? Can I get some response, please? How long will you guys need to go through these drugs? I'm gonna give you five minutes, 10 minutes. No, I'm gonna give you five minutes, five minutes. All you have to do is read the drugs and answer me the question. Okay. So how many physicians do we have today? Do we have, we have Dr. Rahimi, Dr. Singh, Dr. Gita, Dr. Otero, Dr. Alam, Dr. Sana, Dr. S, Dr. Tahera, Dr. BK, okay, and Dr. Noon Mohammed. So that's that. And I'm going to ask each and every one of you, each and every one of you, I'm gonna ask the question and then I'm gonna end the class. Is that okay, yes or no? Do, do you understand what I'm trying to say over here? A quick yes or no would, do, would be very helpful. Yes, okay, so five minutes on the clock. I'm right over here. It's 1.30, I'm gonna ask you at 1.35. Thank you so much.
Okay. <clears throat> okay. Can everyone hear my voice? Yes or no? Can everyone hear my voice? Okay. So let's begin. Okay. Let's begin. With the first physician, Dr. Otero, please unmute yourself and, and answer me the question. Yes, Dr. What are the four drugs that we use for prostatic cancer? It will be uh, the first of all, flutamide. The mm -hmm. second one, the gather relics, okay. abitorin, okay. and also spironolactin. Oh, sorry, no. Ketoconazole and? Ketoconazole. And Ketoconazole. Arabiteron. And... Oh, okay, thank you so much. Yes. Okay, thank you so much. Next one. Next question doc, for Dr. VK. For Dr. VK. Yes, doctor. Okay. What are the adverse effects of estrogen? Do, do not look at the book. Dr. VK, where'd you go? <laughs> Dr. VK? Yes, doctor. Yes, what are the adverse effects of estrogen? Uh, endometrial cancer. We are not going and? to use for, and then abnormal uterine bleeding. And? Um, Something with the veins? DVT. Thank you so much. Okay, next question for Dr. Singh. Name the two SERMS SERMs. Uh, Clomifen, tamoxifen, and deloxifen. Okay, tamoxifen. Do we give? Uh, can they cause endometrial cancer? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. Next question for Dr. Alam. Name the aromatase inhibitors. Uh, okay. And the uh, other was uh, letrozole. Okay. Uh, anestrozole and letrozole. We give and it there's for post exa There's exemestin. Anestrozole, uh, letrozole, and exemestin. Okay, exemestin. thank you so much. Very good. Next one, Dr. Tahira. What is the number one emergency contraceptive, uh, most effective emergency, most effective emergency contraceptive? It's a copper IUD. Very good. What are the contraindications of copper IUD? If there is a, if the patient has abnormality of uterine. Uterine. Very good. Abnormal uterus. And do we give them for migraines? Yes or no? Uh, no, for migraine also it's it causes vasoconstriction, so we don't use. How it. can combined contra IUCD cause vasoconstriction and migraines? Sorry. How does IUCD cause vasoconstriction in migraines? <laughs> Sorry, that's uh, OCP. Oh, OCP, okay. So that was a trick question. Okay, so you fell for that. Okay, so now let's talk about OCP. What are the contraindications of OCP? Uh, OCP is we don't use for uh, those who smoke tobacco. Uh, okay, those who smoke tobacco and endometrial cancer and yes. uh, right history of thrombosis and all that. Thank you so much. Next one is Dr. Sana. Well, what are the tocolytics? Name the tocolytics. So these are three M's. Uh, uh, no, sorry. Mm -hmm, it, mm -hmm, it could mm -hmm. be, uh, it, it is endomethacin. It's uh, nifedipin mm -hmm. and uh, magnesium sulfate uh, and terbutaline. Very good. And the three M's you said are for what? Yeah, yeah sorry. Three the three M's are for uh, abortion. Um, abortion. The, Methotrexate. Okay, so Methotrexate. Then? And mesoprostone and mefeprostone. Very good. Thank you so much. Okay. Who else is here? Who else is here? Dr. Rahimi? Dr. Rahimi, what are, what is the action of finasteride? What is the action of finasteride? How does finasteride work? Can, we, can I ask the same question to someone else very quickly? Do we have Dr. Ethar with us today? Yes or no, Dr. Ethar is here or not? Okay. Dr. Ethar is not here, okay. So move forward. Uh, very quickly, what are the drugs that we give for BPH? Who can tell me this? Please write me in the chat box, drugs for BPH. What are the drugs that we give for BPH? You have to unmute yourself and tell me the answer. Dr. VK, uh, yes. Finish today. And? Tamsulosin. And? Um, I remember only two doctors. 
Phosphodiesters 5 inhibitors, Tandalafil, yes or no? Yes. Okay, the Phosphodiesters mm -hmm. 5 inhibitors, so that's it. And who can tell me the last answer? Let me see the last answer of the week and the last answer for the reproductive system. Who can help me out? It's a very easy question. Very easy question. Please write me in the chat box. Eh? Anyone? Dr. Otero, yes. Yes, doctor. Last question, very easy. Do you guys, do you, did you understand the lecture or not? Yes, doctor, I did. Did you, did, did uh, you enjoy the lecture or not? Yes, I enjoyed oh, the lecture. Good, very good, very good. Okay, so my last question for you is, are you going to solve your world questions for the reproductive system to make sure that you do not forget the reproductive system, yes or no? Yes. Okay, and do you advise all your friends in the class to do the same? Correct. Very good, very good. Thank you so much. Okay, that was a very easy question. Okay, so that's that. Thank you so much, guys, and that's all for today. Uh, today, we're, since it's a Friday, I want to keep the lecture up to here. It's also because I'm not feeling that well. And uh, what is the next chapter that we will start from Monday? From Monday, we will start with the respiratory system, okay? We will finish the respiratory system on Monday. We will start with the respiratory system on Monday, and all your friends, you know, like how you guys have your friends who wants to come and join, please let them know that they should contact us this weekend so that they can join from Monday with a new chapter, okay, with a new chapter. So that's that. Thank you so much. Hope you guys have a great day today. I wish you guys all the best. I'm really proud of each and every one of you. You guys are great physicians, great students. Hope you guys enjoy your weekend with your friends and family. Try to relax for a little bit so that next week, Monday, we can start fresh, okay, so that we can start fresh. Thank you so much. And uh, do we have Dr. Rahimi with us today? Dr. Rahimi, very quickly. Dr. Rahimi, can you hear my voice? Okay. Can I get the attention of Dr. Rahimi, please? Very quickly. She might be on headphones. Okay. So I just wanted to let her know that I wanted that I um, apologize for not being able to start the class a little bit early today. Uh, that, that's because I was feeling a little sick. From next week, we, we are going to make sure that the class starts exactly when I say the class starts, okay? I apologize for the discrepancy in timing for the whole week. I apologize for this. Yes, Dr. Tahira, what question do you have? Uh, excuse me, I was asking if uh, you could uh, share uh, this reproductive, all of them in uh, Google Drive as you did for other systems. Yes, I have not uploaded your batches lectures on Google Drive yet, but I do have reproductive lectures from previous batches over here. If you guys want, then I can share you this lecture, share this lecture with you guys. And um, while I prepare the lecture of uh, your batch, then I can and then I can give you the those lectures too. So, do you guys want access to the previous lectures? Yes or no? Uh, I think this oh, uh, oh, oh. You were... How much? didn't go with me. I need to charge. Just give me one second. Okay, so uh, do you guys want the reproductive lectures of the last batch? Yes or no? Uh, yes, we want. Uh, but if you uh, if you share the new ones, it's better because this okay. uh, the new ones that you share, they have. Mm -hmm. No, no, I, I, I will share the new ones, but it will take me some time to upload them in the Google Drive. So okay. while I do that, in the meantime, do you want the previous batch lectures or? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, okay. So, so let me share it with you. One second. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. Um, you have there, you know, they, mm -hmm. I know for sure. Are you, what are you using right now? Math, it's math. So um, I, I can probably definitely push them to get you the computer, but it's definitely not going to get it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I send it to you. Please let me know. Does anyone else have any questions? Okay. okay, so thank you so much, guys. I wish you guys all the best. Hope you have a great day. Ask your friends to come and join the lecture from Monday. Uh, they can send us an email and uh, we will get back to them. And if you have any questions, send us an email and we'll get back to you. So I wish you guys all the best. I'm going to see you on Monday. At 10 a.m. Okay, bye bye now. So, I can definitely, you know, talk with IT about getting you the machine, which is why I let it, you know, immediately down.